So ladies, I'm sure that uh, most of you are uh, sports fans and you follow sports, sports personalities, right? That's what moms do, right? Sure. And um, some of you have um, followed uh, a team called the Los Angeles Lakers. Lakers, yeah. And uh, well, they, they've over the years have had a rather uh, amazing competition and, and um, uh, between, with uh, a group called the Phoenix Suns. <clears throat> Now, the Phoenix Suns had a uh, rather unusual all-star all that used to play for them. Paul, I'll try to be this side of the flag for you to see there. <laughs> we'll dance together, okay. <laughs> the, the Phoenix Suns had, an, had a rather unusual all-star that played for them. Uh, he's now a sportscaster. His name is Charles Barkley. <laughs> He competed against uh, Michael Jordan, uh, and, and there was a, a, quite a conversation going on about uh, sports figures being role players. And, and Barkley said, I'm not a role player, I mean, a, a role model. I'm not a role model, you know, no one's following after me. <laughs> well, that's a bunch of baloney. We are all role models. Now, we might not be a good role model, and there are some things that about Barkley, definitely we're not good role models. but. But we are all role models for other people around us. Today we're going to look at the, the Thessalonian church again and, and the example, the, the, and we're, going to, we're trying to go through this process of really evaluating the church and evaluating ourselves as individuals. And today we need to look at ourselves and what kind of a role model are we? What are people saying about you? <laughs> when, when people talk about you, because somebody's talking about you, what do they, what do they say about you? What, how do they describe you? What do people not only say about you, but what do people say about Crestline First Baptist Church? <laughs> There's, again, all kinds of comments, you know. Well, let's face it, we've had people leave First Baptist Church, haven't we? And sometimes leave with anger. And, and so people can say all kinds of things. Small community like this, oh my goodness. <laughs> Gossip is uh, always out there, right? And all kinds of conversations can happen. What are they saying about the church? Uh, you see, we are imitators of Jesus Christ. And we are models for other believers if we know Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ lives in you, you are a model for other people who know Jesus. And not only for other people who know Jesus, but you're also a model and you may be the only Jesus that someone else meets. Because Jesus lives in you. And someone else who never has met Jesus is only going to meet Jesus because they meet you. What kind of model are you? Are you living as an example that you would say others should follow? What's that age-old phrase? Don't do as I do, do as I say. Is that the kind of model you are? Don't follow my example, just do the things I tell you to do. I might not do them, but you better. Is, is that the kind of model you are? Because they're going to follow the first. And are you, are we, are we following the example, the model of Jesus Christ? Because he is our model. And I guess this question is one that I really want you to kind of ponder throughout this morning's message. Would you invite someone else to follow your example? To follow your lifestyle? To follow your behaviors? To follow your prayer life? To follow the way you apply the word of God? to follow your words, would you invite someone to follow your example as you follow the example of Jesus Christ? So our text this morning is 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6 through 10. Last week we looked at the fact that Paul was celebrating the good things that the, the Thessalonian church was doing. It was a church that only had three weeks, three weeks with Paul, and then he had to get out of there because the persecution was so bad. 
and he's writing back to the Thessalonian church because he wants to see how they're doing because they became a church in just three weeks. That's pretty amazing. Plant a church in three weeks. Go in, preach three weeks, and then leave, and you have a church planted. And, and they're under severe persecution. In fact, that's why they send the church there, the Christians there, these brand new babies who have just accepted Jesus into their life, just three weeks old. They Paul, you got to get out of here because we don't want you dying here. And so they send him away. And now we come to verse 6, chapter 1. You became imitators of us and the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given to the Holy Spirit. We preached, you suffered, it's been bad. In fact, they're still being persecuted. They've been arrested, they've been beaten. These are just brand new baby Christians. These are not old time saints, tried and true and tough and yarly. These are people who have just, just come to know Jesus Christ. And so, you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. What does he say? You became imitators of us and of the Lord. Paul urges the Corinthian church, I urge you to imitate me. Now, that's kind of fun if you're playing follow the leader, right? The Weikert family love to go out on, on the Balboa Island and, and walk around. Remember, there's uh, six kids I've lost track of how many grandkids and great-grandkids there are now. But they'd go out on a vacation together, and they'd walk around the island, and they'd play follow the leader. And they did goof, goofy things, yes, like walk like a duck and quack and all kinds of things like that. From, from dad to the littlest, they were all doing follow. It was crazy. And, and maybe it's, 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 it's fun to say, follow me and follow my example if you're playing follow the leader. But can you say that? Because this is what Paul said. He says, follow my lead. Follow my example. Even when things are really rough. Even if I'm not perfect. Follow my example. In fact, 1 Corinthians 11, he says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Now, most of us would say, boy, you're kind of egotistical, aren't you, Paul? Telling people to follow your example. Ah, but look what he's saying. He says, look, I'm following Jesus. Will you follow me as I follow him? Follow my example as I follow the example of Jesus Christ. In Ephesians, he said it this way, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So he's saying, look, follow the example of love. Jesus loved us. Jesus died for us. Let's do the same thing and invite other people to follow your example as you're loving like Jesus Christ loved you. In Hebrews, he says this, we do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. You're supposed to imitate other people who are following Jesus Christ, who love Jesus Christ, who understand Jesus Christ died for them. In 2 Thessalonians, Paul's writing again to the Thessalonians, and he says, for you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you. We weren't lazy. We weren't sitting around doing nothing. In fact, we were working and, and actually paying our own way. And verse 9, he says, We did this not because we do not have the right to such help, but in order to offer ourselves a, as a model for you to imitate. Can you imagine saying that to a group of people? We lived in such a way among you because we wanted to model a behavior for you to imitate. How many people would like to say, follow the way I drive my car. It's like Jesus drives it. <laughs> Imitate my behavior on the, on the internet. Imitate the way I spend money. Imitate the way I shop. 
imitate what I say when I'm ticked off. How many of us would say that to someone else? And Paul is saying, look, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. To the Thessalonians, he says, whoa, you guys have been so close to Jesus by just getting to know him right, right here in the early stages of your Christian life. And you have already imitated, you've already been an example for others to follow. Are we? George Peters talks about what a disciple is. A disciple is more than just a learner, which is the, the meaning of the term, right? Disciple means learner, follower. But George says this way, he says, a Christian disciple is more than a believer. A disciple is more than a learner, at least a learner in the ordinary sense of the word. A disciple is more than a follower, an imitator of Christ, more than a holy enthusiast for Christ. Yea, even more than living a life full of devotion to the Lord. Those, good, those would all be things we would, oh, wow. It's, yeah, disciple, right? But he says it's more than that. A disciple is a believing person living a life of conscious and constant identification with the Lord constant identification with the Lord in life, death, and resurrection. And doing that through words, behaviors, attitudes, motives, and purpose, fully realizing Christ's absolute ownership of his life, joyfully embracing the servanthood of Christ, delighting in the lordship of Christ, and living by the abiding, indwelling resources of Christ according to the imprinted pattern and purpose of Christ for the chief end of glorifying his Lord and Savior. A disciple is like committed to Christ. Paul goes on in 1 Thessalonians. He says, you welcome the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. The Thessalonians are suffering severely for Jesus Christ. They are dying, literally, for Jesus Christ. Jason's been ripped out of his home and beat and a couple of his friends. And that's where Paul had been staying for just these three weeks. How would you like to get beat just because you had somebody living in your house? Somebody you knew you didn't even know four weeks ago. They drop into your house and the police come and they beat you up because you had this person living in your house with you. And that's the Thessalonian church. And even as they are suffering, what does Paul say about them? Even while they're suffering, they are experiencing the joy of the Holy Spirit. There is something special that the Spirit of God is giving them in the midst of their pain as they feel the presence of God with them. Notice, notice some of what they said. They said they received the word with how? With affliction and joy. They received the word of God with pain and suffering and joy. And this is how they imitated the Lord. They were being afflicted, one pastor said, and internally there was joy. It's an unusual combination. For the man of the world, it is impossible to experience joy and affliction simultaneously. It's like the parent, right? Spare the rod, spoil the child. So the parent's spanking. Not out of anger, not out of abuse. The parent's spanking. And what's the, what's the, what's the parent saying? This is hurting me more than it's hurting you. And how many a child, because they could handle the pain, is sitting there laughing because they're getting struck and it doesn't hurt? I don't think that's joy and suffering at the same time, is it? <laughs> the, the, the Christians in Thessalonica are experiencing joy as they're suffering for Jesus, as they're going through heartache and trials and, that are really severe, they are experiencing a, an energy from the Holy Spirit that's carrying them through that and it's the joy of the Lord. John MacArthur writes that these new believers in Thessalonica experienced severe persecution, but the genuineness of their salvation transcended that affliction so that they never lost their joy. 
They were so excited about knowing Jesus that nothing was going to take it away and nothing was going to take the joy of that salvation away from them. Jesus loves me. Jesus died for me. Jesus is alive. Jesus is living in me. I can feel the presence of the Spirit of God with me. So go ahead and beat me because I'm never giving up this new thing that I've found, the joy of the Lord. In John 16, 33, Jesus said, I have told you these things. Remember John 16? This is right in the middle of the last night that Jesus has with his disciples. He's getting them ready for his crucifixion the next day. They still don't understand. They still don't believe it's coming. They still don't know why he's talking this way, but he's talking about death and life, and he's saying he's going to leave them, and then he's going to come back, and he's preparing a place for them. And then in John 16, he talks to them about about the Holy Spirit and the peace that's going to come from the Holy Spirit. And in verse 33, he says this, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart. Or say it another way. But be joyful. I have overcome the world. No matter what our circumstance. No matter what our trial. No matter what we're going through. You're going to have trouble in this world. But be joyful. I have overcome the world Edmund Hebert said, perhaps our Christian lives are so lacking in this joy because our Christian profession costs us so little. Maybe we're not experiencing the joy of the Lord because we're not standing up and telling people of G- about Jesus and suffering because of it. Maybe we're simply giving so little to him that it costs us nothing and therefore we're not experiencing the joy of the Lord. Ladies, those of you who had a baby, nine months of what? (laughs) I should get you to stand up and give that. (laughs) Oh, it's nine months of joy, right? (laughs) Especially getting ready to give birth in August. (laughs) The heat's coming. (laughs) The the kick already. We saw it this morning. (laughs) But there is a sense in which there's nine months of anticipation, right? Nine months of waiting, nine months of hoping. Uh, We lived in a day when we didn't know whether it was going to be a boy or girl. Of course, Debbie said that if it was a boy, she was sending him back. (laughs) Welcome, Tim. (laughs) After she had her boys, I think she never wanted girls, but (laughs) now she gets her chance with Tenley. <clears throat> nine months. <laughs> nine months can seem like forever for a mother to be. In the first trimester, hormonal changes sometimes cause lingering morning sickness. Anyone have that? <laughs> Uh, emotions rise to the surface, guys, if you're married to a girl who's been pregnant, okay? Uh, prolonging afternoon blues. Then a changing appetite stretches out evening hours with late night cravings for pizza, chocolate, and dill pickles. <laughs> yeah, I, I, no, I don't recall Debbie ever having any of those weird um, cravings. <laughs> During the next three months, mom outgrows her clothes, spends long hours looking for a new wardrobe, <laughs> thinks she's ugly, <laughs> right? And the last trimester turns normal activity into a chore as the final watch begins. But then suddenly, the endless waiting is over. And nine months becomes like yesterday's newspaper. They are gone. They become insignificant. A faint memory overcome by joy. Ask the new mom if she regrets enduring her pregnancy. And at birth, never. Now they might be saying, never again, too. (laughs) That changes once they hold a baby again, doesn't it, ladies? (laughs) Hebrews 12, 1 to 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses,